Hello students, welcome to the lecture on perception, attitudes and values. And after this lecture, we will be able to learn the following objectives. Explain the concept of perception, define term attitude and its function, describe value and its type, explain the theory of Abraham Maslow's Let's start with the concept of perception, attitudes and values. Gordon Allport and his trait theory explains personality in terms of the comparison between variables. He argues that the characteristic of extraversion explains personality in a way a person is more sociable or reserved. A second important fact is the agreeableness of the people. People can be war or antagonistic depending on a certain circumstances they are involved in. In order to know if a person is hardworking or unreliable, he considers the term conscientiousness to explain this conduct. The emotional stability gives an idea of how the people used to behave and face day-to-day -day problems. People can be calm or insecure in this case. Finally, he analyzes how much openness to experience is a person in terms of creativity or narrow interests brings a person when giving response to a certain responsibility or situation more related in an organization environment. It is important to say that as well as in personality, each person perceives a situation in a different way. Perceptions are influences by individuals' view of the world as their expectations, feelings, values, beliefs, language, experience, self-image among others which make the perception of the reality dissimilar. In organizations, the perception of someone is influenced by factors such as stereotypes, judgments, mood among others that do not allow people clearly define how is somebody and which are his or her intentions. These factors are usually considered as the principal barriers between the perceiver and the target. Let us now discuss the perception. Perception is a process by which individuals organize and interpret their sensory impressions in order to give meaning to their environment. Individuals are unique in that they possess their own lens to form conclusions about the very same situation. People see things differently and depending on their background, education, the current situation and mood are all prone to make different rational interpretations of the exact same situation. If a manager perceives something in one way or another and bases an important business decision on the perception, the organization will either benefit or not benefit from the decision. Managers should understand the facts along with the situation in order to conclude with an appropriate decision. A manager's perception and decisions will affect the organization's behavior. One's perception and decision will trickle down and may initiate several other decisions decided by the organizational associates. People, especially subordinates, base decisions off of one's individual's perception and decisions. Perceiving is probably the most important condition of being alive. It provides awareness of the world and defines what we call reality by organizing and interpreting information gathered from the limited band of reception of our senses. The purpose of our senses has been evolutionary. Their goal has been to establish reality as something that happens to us, but what we perceive is not what is out there. There is no inherent value in the incredibly complex patterns of light that fall into our eyes, and yet, we see coherent forms and motions enabling us to survive by distinguishing between a flower and a truck running towards us full speed. If we realize that our sensory perceptions are only an evolutionary tool and not the ultimate reality, then we can start seeing life as a whole undivided totality of which we are an active part. The ancient scriptures describe the world as illusion or maya because of the difference between what we perceive as real and what is real. While our classical worldview instilled through the philosophies of Newton and Darwin prevents us from accepting a different paradigm. 
In the meantime, the implications of modern science discoveries are creeping in our mindset and our understanding of what reality is evolves, while science is trying to answer some of the questions raised by humans since time immemorial. As the quantum physicist David Bohm said, the attempt to live according to the notion that the fragments are really separate is in essence what has led us to the growing series of extremely urgent crises that is confronting us today. Perhaps the mystics are right stating that there is no inside self separate from the outside world, but rather one seamless intimate totality always changing when viewed from the object perspective and never changing when viewed from the perspective of the totality. There is no outside world. There are no others. We are complex living systems, part of each other and the larger world we inhabit. The world is in me as much as I am in the world. Perceptive shortcuts are often used when judging other individuals. What does perceptive shortcut mean? Perceptive shortcut, simply put, is making a quick assumption based on the results of specific behavioral evaluation techniques. There are a few behavioral evaluation techniques. To name a few, there is the selective perception technique, which refers to the collection of bits and pieces of information and interpreting them based on interest, background, experience, and attitude. There's the halo effect, which refers to draw a general impression based on a single characteristic, that is, intelligence. Perceptual process perception, as revealed by the definitions, is composed of six processes, viz. receiving, selecting, organizing, interpreting, checking, and reaching to stimuli. These processes are influenced by the perceived and the situation. The perceptual process is a sequence of steps that begins with the environment and leads to perception of a stimulus and an action in response to the stimulus. This process is continual, but do not spend a great deal of time thinking about the actual process that occurs when perceived the many stimuli that surround at any given moment. The process of transforming the light that falls on our retinas into an actual visual image happens unconsciously and automatically. The subtle changes in pressure against skin that allow to feel object occur without a single thought. In order to fully understand how the perception process works, we will start by breaking down each step. The steps in the perceptual process, the environmental stimulus, the attended stimulus, the image on the retina, transduction, environmental stimulus. The world is full of stimuli that can attract attention through various senses. The environmental stimulus is everything in environment that has the potential to be perceived. This might include anything that can be seen, touched, taste, smell, or heard. It might also involve the sense of proprioception, such as the movements of the arms and legs or the change in position of the body in relation to objects in the environment. For example, imagine that you are out on a morning jog at your local pub. As performed workout, there are a wide variety of environmental stimuli that might capture attention. The tree branches are swaying in the slight breeze, a man is out on the grass playing fetch with his golden retriever, a car drives past with the windows rolled down and the music blaring, a duck splashes in a nearby pond. All of these represent the environmental stimuli, serving as a starting point for the perceptual process. Attended Stimulus The attended stimulus is a specific object in the environment on which our attention is focused. In many cases, we might focus on stimuli that are familiar to us, such as the face of a friend in a crowd of strangers, at the local coffee shop. In other instances, we are likely to attend to stimuli that have some degree of novelty. From earlier example, let us imagine that during the morning job, focus our attention on the duck floating in the nearby pond. The duck represents the attended stimulus. During the next step of the perceptual process, the visual process will progress. Transduction. The image on the retina is then transformed into electrical signals in a process known as transduction. This allows the visual messages to be transmitted to the brain.
to be interpreted. Neural processing. The electrical signals then undergo neural processing. The path followed by a particular signal depends on what type of signal it is through the series of interconnects neurons located throughout the body. Electrical signals are propagated from the receptor cells to the brain. Perception. The perception process, we actually perceive the stimulus object in the environment. It is at this point that we become consciously aware of the stimulus. Recognition. Perception does not just involve becoming consciously aware of the stimuli. It is also necessary for the brain to categorize and interpret what is we are sensing. Our ability to interpret and give meaning to the object is the next step, known as recognition. Now the process of receiving stimuli. The human organism is structured with five sensory organs, winds, vision, hearing, smell, touch and tasting. There is a sixth sense about which much is speculated and nothing is known. We receive stimuli through the organs. Secondary organs receive not only physical objects, they receive events or objects that have been repressed. We may not be able to report the existence of certain stimuli, but our behavior reveals that we are often subject to their influence. Similarly, stimuli need not be external to us. External factors influencing selection. The external factors influencing selection are nature. By nature we mean whether the object is visual or auditory and whether it involves pictures, people or animals. Location. The best location of a visual stimulus for attracting attention is directly in front of the eyes in the center of a page. When this location is not possible in a newspaper or a magazine, a position in the upper portion of a page is more favorable than one in the lower portions and the left hand side receives more attention than the right hand side. Intensity. Stimuli of higher intensity are perceived more than the objects with low intensity. A loud noise, strong odor or bright light will be noticed more than a soft sound, weak odor or dim light. Size. Generally objects of larger size attract more attention than the smaller ones. The maintenance engineering staff may pay more attention to a big machine than to a small one. Even though the smaller one costs as much and as important to the operation. Internal factors influencing selection. Internal factors influencing selection of stimuli include learning, psychological needs, age differences, interest, ambivalence and paranoid perception. These factors relate to oneself. Learning. Learning a cognitive factor has considerable influence on perception. It creates expectancy in people. People tend to perceive what they want to perceive. Psychological needs. Needs play a significant role in perceptual selectivity. Unreal things often look real because of deprived needs. Implications of perception on performance and satisfaction productivity. What individuals perceive from their work situation will influence their productivity. More than the situation itself, then whether a job is actually interesting or challenging is not relevant. Job satisfaction. Job satisfaction is a highly subjective and feeling of the benefits that derive from the job. Clearly his variable is critically linked to perception. Now, moving on to the next topic, we will study the attitudes. Attitudes are evaluative statements, either favorable or unfavorable, concerning objects, people or events. They reflect how one feels about something. To fully understand attitudes, we need to consider the fundamental properties, characteristics of attitudes. These are good thoughts. Nobel winning physicist Max Planck said, when change the way look at things, the things look at change. Thinking can succeed is a key characteristic of a good attitude. Self-assurance. Those with a good attitude know their own capabilities. A characteristic of their good attitude is they accept poor results realistically. They do not become negative if they do not win the first time they try something because they are realistic about their abilities and talents. The function of attitudes. Attitudes can serve functions for the individual. Daniel Katz outlines four functional areas. Knowledge. Attitude provides meaning, knowledge, for life. The knowledge function refers to our need for a world 
which is consistent and relatively stable. Self, ego, expressive. The attitudes we express help communicate who we are and may make us feel good because we have asserted our identity. Adaptive. If a person holds and or expresses socially acceptable attitudes, other people will reward them with approval and social acceptance. Components of attitudes. Attitude structure can be described in terms of three components. Effective component. This involves a person's feelings, emotions about the attitude object. For example, I am scared of spiders. Behavioral or cognitive component. The way the attitude we have influences how we act or behave. For example, he will avoid spiders and scream if he sees one. Cognitive component. This involves a person's belief, knowledge about an attitude object. For example, he believes spiders are dangerous. Types of attitudes. The OB focuses our attention on a very limited number of job-related attitudes. These job-related attitudes tap positive or negative evaluations that employees hold about aspects of the work environment. Typically, there are three primary attitudes that are of concern to us, that is, job satisfaction, job involvement, and organizational commitment. Job satisfaction. Job satisfaction refers to an individual's general attitudes towards his or her job. A person with a high level of job satisfaction holds positive attitude towards the job, while a person who is dissatisfied with his or her job holds negative attitudes about the job. Job involvement. The term job involvement states that job involvement measures the degree to which a person identifies with his job, actively participates in it, and considers his performance important to his self-worth. Attitudes and consistency. People seek consistency among the attitudes and between the attitudes and behavior. This means that individuals seek to reconcile divergent attitudes and align their attitudes and behavior so they appear rational and consistent. Cognitive Dissonance Theory Cognitive Dissonance Theory, developed by Leon Festinger, is concerned with the relationships among cognitions. Cognition for the purpose of this theory may be thought of as a piece of knowledge. The knowledge may be about an attitude, an emotion, a behavior, a value, and so on. Cognitive irrelevance probably describes the bulk of the relationships among a person's cognitions. Irrelevance simply means the two cognitions have nothing to do with each other. Two cognitions are consonant if one cognition follows from or fits with the other. People like consonants among their cognitions. We do not know whether this stems from the nature of the human organism or whether it is learned during the process of socialization. But people appear to prefer cognitions that fit together to those that do not. Let's know the meaning of value. Values are defined as those things that are important to or valued by someone. That someone can be an individual or collectively an organization. One place where values are important is in relation to vision. One of the imperatives for organizational vision is that it must be based on and consistent with the organization's core values. In one example of a vision statement, we will look at later, the organization's core values in this case, integrity, professionalism, caring, teamwork, and stewardship were deemed important enough to be included with the statement of the organization's vision. When values are shared by all members of an organization, they are extraordinarily important tools for making judgments, assessing probable outcomes of contemplated actions, and choosing among alternatives. Types of values. Personal values define who an individual is. They serve as guides in handling situations and interacting with others. Organizational values are the standards that guide an individual's behavior in a professional context. They define how an individual accomplishes work, interacts in professional situations, and how he makes decisions relative to his job or career. Cultural values are standards that guide how a person relates meaningfully to others in different social situations. Instrumental and terminal values. There are two kinds of values that people have, instrumental values and terminal values. Instrumental values consist primarily of personal characteristic and character traits. Terminal values are those things that we can work towards or we think are most important and that we feel are most desirable. 
the modern era gave birth to a new field of research, the study of human behavior, a psychology. Engrossed in the study of pathology, mainstream, psychologists such as Freud and Skinner did not give as much thought to the sources of happiness as to the roots of unhappiness. One of the earliest psychologists to focus attention on happy individuals and their psychological trajectory was Abraham Maslow, who is most well known for his hierarchy of needs. Inspired by the work of the humanistic psychologist Eric Fromm, Maslow insists that the urge for self-actualization is deeply entrenched in the human psyche, but only surfaces once the more basic needs are fulfilled. Once the powerful needs for food, security, love and self-esteem are satisfied, a deep desire for creative expression and self-actualization rises to the surface. Through this hierarchy of his needs, Maslow succeeds in combining the insights of earlier psychologists such as, such as Freud and Skinner who focus on the more basic human instincts and the more upbeat work of Jung and Fromm who insist that the desire for happiness is equally worthy of attention. Abraham Maslow essentially made self-fulfillment and happiness a central part of his life's work. In a break from the other experts of his time, he wanted to understand what motivated the great people of history and to understand human potential. He wanted to know what humans are capable of as the healthiest self. Here today with About.com to give you an overview of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You're probably wondering, who's Abraham Maslow? Well, Maslow was a researcher and a pioneer in the field of psychology in the 50s who was seeking to synthesize a large amount of information about research related to human motivation. Ultimately, the fruits of his research were that he presented a hierarchy of needs categorized by two groups, deficiency needs and growth needs. The important thing about the hierarchy is that it's built on a foundation of basic needs that must be met and satisfied before higher levels of the needs are met. So let's take a look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So the bottom of the pyramid for Maslow's hierarchy of needs are our physiological needs. Those needs that are required for us to sustain life. Breathing, sleep, water, food, and even sex are important for us because we want to perpetuate the species. The next step up on the pyramid are safety needs. Needs are met when individuals feel safe and secure with no threat of physical or emotional harm. Those areas and safety concerns are going to be living in a safe area, medical insurance, job security, financial reserves. Difficult, I know, in this economy, but those things that are essential for us to survive. In the middle of Maslow's pyramid, we begin to see our emotional needs of love and belonging. Once a person has satisfied the physiological needs like sleep and breathing and safety, living in a safe area and knowing that you are secure from threat or harm of danger, higher needs become more important. Our need for friends, our sense of belonging, and our ability to give and receive love. These are all emotional needs that need to be met as we continue through Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Next, it becomes important as autonomous human beings to experience a sense of esteem, to feel good about ourselves. We want to feel like we're important, that we matter. Those things that make us feel important and that we do matter on this earth are self-respect, achievement, attention, recognition, and our reputation. Finally, the apex of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is self-actualization. Self-actualization has been defined by self-help gurus and psychologists the world over. According to Maslow, self-actualization is the quest of reaching your full potential and being connected with the world. Some of those traits of being connected with the world and reaching self-actualization include truth, wisdom, justice, morality, and a lack of prejudice. Keep in mind though, as you think about self-actualization, it's not an endpoint, it's not a destination, it's a journey, it's something we as humans are constantly trying to achieve. Finally, the benefits of understanding Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Well, if you are in a social and behavioral science field, a psychologist, a counselor, a social worker, it's important to know where your clients are on the pyramid. You must understand where your patients are before you are able to address, assess, or even work with psychological issues. It doesn't make a lot of sense to delve into a patient's negative childhood experiences when they're struggling to keep a roof over their head and maintain steady employment. Understanding Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a critical building block to understand other theories related to human growth and development. 
Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Each of us is motivated by needs. Our most basic needs are inborn, having evolved over tens of thousands of years. Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs helps to explain how these needs motivate us all. Maslow's hierarchy of needs states that we must satisfy each need in turn, starting with the first, which deals with the most obvious needs for survival itself. Only when the lower order needs of physical and emotional well-being are satisfied are we concerned with the higher order needs of influence and personal development. Conversely, if the things that satisfy our lower order needs are swept away, we are no longer concerned about the maintenance of our higher order needs.